Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Kumar Murthy, and I'm the director of the Fields Institute. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Institute, uh, Fields is a research institute for the mathematical sciences. The Institute is named after John Charles Fields, the, the same Fields who conceived the notion of a medal to honor mathematicians who have made uh, outstanding contributions to the field and who show extraordinary promise for future contributions. The Field Institute is located in Toronto, Canada, and is about 25 years old. It is supported by grants from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, the province of Ontario, the National Science Foundation, and the Simons Foundation. It is also supported by nine principal sponsoring universities and 12 affiliated universities, mostly in Ontario. This evening, uh, we're talking about 2014 Fields medalist, Mario Mirzakhani. I hope you have had a chance to see the wonderful documentary movie, Secrets of the Surface, about her life and work. Indeed, she was an extraordinary mathematician who, who would have been 43 today. Uh, on this uh, day, her birthday, I'm happy to see uh, that we have a special group of people with us, our panel, to talk about Mariam, about her work, and about the movie. Before I introduce the panelists, I want to direct you to the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen, which you can find there, to, uh, and which you can use to submit questions. Uh, and uh, you can see what other the questions that have been posed so far. And if you like a question, click the thumbs up so we know that which questions people are most interested in. And I will do my best to put those to our panelists for their uh, thoughts and ideas. Let me begin by introducing our panelists. Uh, George Cicere is the director of the movie you just saw. Hello. George has been a, a writer and independent filmmaker since 1968 and has directed over 30 films. Much of his work uh, since the late 1980s has been about mathematicians. In particular, he made N is a Number, a portrait of Paul Erdős, and Counting from Infinity, Itang Zhang and the Twin Primes Conjecture. George's work has been recognized with the 2009 Policy Board for Mathematics Communications Award. George is joining us this evening from Oakland, California. Welcome, George. Thank you very much, Kumar, uh, for the introduction. And I'd like to thank the uh, Fields Institute for hosting this evening and for showing this film. I understand uh, you've had the biggest, I've had the biggest audience for this film tonight, and I'm very happy that you were able to do this. Indeed, there's a big audience because I think there's uh, a lot of uh, eagerness and, uh, and appetite in the public to know about uh, Mariam and her work. Uh, the next panelist I'd like to introduce to you is Ingrid Dobeshi. She's the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of Mathematics and of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Duke University. Considered one of the world's leading mathematicians, Ingrid is perhaps best known for her work on wavelets and their application in image compression. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, USA, a MacArthur Fellow, uh, which you might know is colloquially known as the Genius Fellowship, uh, and a past president of the International Mathematical Union. Uh, besides her mathematical research, she's very interested in the improvement of mathematics education in schools. Ingrid is joining us from Raleigh, Durham in North Carolina. Uh, great to have you with us, Ingrid. Very nice to be here. Diana Davis. Uh, got her PhD from Brown University and is currently faculty at Swarthmore College. Her research interests are in dynamical systems and polygonal billiards. Besides her research accomplishments, she is also known for her excellence in teaching and communicating mathematics. In particular, her video explaining one of the key theorems in her thesis uh, through dance has been seen more than 100,000 times. Quite amazing. In 2018, the Fields Institute held its annual Fields Medal Symposium and Diana gave a rousing lecture to students about the work of Maria Mirzakhani. Diana is joining us today from Paris, France. Thanks for joining us, Diana. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here. I realize that with the time difference, it's now early in the morning for you, so a special thank you. Uh, Kasra Rafi is professor of mathematics at the University of Toronto. He received his PhD from Stony Brook and works in the field of Teichmuller theory and geometric group theory. One of his most influential papers is called Counting Closed Geodesics in Strata, which was a joint work with Maria Mirzakhani and Alex Eskin and appeared in the leading journal Inventiones Mathematicae. Besides being a brilliant mathematician, Kasra is a very approachable teacher. And one of his innovations is what he calls the hyperbolic lunch, uh, which is an opportunity for him to enjoy lunch with his students while one of them speaks about some piece of beautiful mathematics 
that they've recently encountered. Kasra is here in Toronto. Thanks for joining us, Kasra. Thank you very much, Kumar. Yes, I'm glad to be here. So welcome to all of the panelists. I thought I'd uh, start by uh, asking Katra a little bit uh, about Mariam's mathematics. You collaborated with Mariam and uh, you understand the area very well. And in the film, we got a sense of the significance of Mariam's work. But I wonder if you could shed more light on that and help us uh, to place her work in the mathematical landscape, its uh, depth and novelty, and perhaps also the legacy. Uh, is her work continuing to influence mathematicians? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so it, the, the short answer is that yes, it is having a great influence. I mean, ju just to check for this uh, video, I, I, I looked up a uh, number of times that the papers of Mariam have been referenced throughout the years. And you can, you can check this in Google Scholar. And then last year, she has received most number of citations than any other year before. Oh. Like mm -hmm. if, if you look at the the archive, the, the, the papers, people, people post their new papers. I mean, she's still posting papers. Like the, the works in progress she had, the, the things that she was cooking, and they're, they're slowly coming up. The, so if, if you didn't know, you would think the papers coming up. My last talk I gave a few days ago it was a joint work with, with Marianne. Oh. The, I mean, of course, it would have been probably finished earlier if she, if she was here to help me, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, we are still like trying to understand the stuff, to digest the stuff, to, uh, to push it forward. And then the ideas she already had, you know, forget about the, what she would have come up with, but the ideas she already had are slowly making into the print mm -hmm. uh, and are being cited and being digested and, and, and moving forward. So yeah, the type of math she did besides being um, deep, it, it was somehow, immediately captivating I, I would say like anybody who listened to it they were like ah oh, this is great i want to work on this this is what i want to think about when the students thought about this they just they're like oh this is this i want this to be my field i mean like if i want to get people to work with me i send people to read mariam's papers and i say ah oh, see <laughs> this is the kind of math i do or like or the surveys that she does like if i want to somebody to know like what the field is about they i send them to read like surveys about mariam's work and so Mm -hmm. so By the I'm, way, in the in the movie, you said that there, when you were uh, when you were uh, working with her on the on the Olympiad, you you had to read a complex analysis book to understand something she had solved. One of our question uh, audience members wants to know what was that about? Yeah, I've been asked this before. I try to remember it. I I can't <laughs> unfortunately. I I remember involved computing residues at some point, but uh, <laughs> that's how I, I mean it wasn't an easy problem. So. And it's many, many decades ago, unfortunately. So I can, yeah, I don't remember it, but uh, that's right. I mean, she, she, she told me this story that the, I mean, I, I told her this story that I remember this. And so we tried to figure out what it was and we couldn't, but she kind of remembered it. And she said, yeah, life hasn't changed so much. I mean, you kind of still do the same thing. You, you try to understand somebody else's work, maybe not, not completely understanding it, but use their tools, mm -hmm. of their ideas and then mm -hmm. solve your own problems with it. So mm -hmm. yeah, she was extremely good at that. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe I'll follow this up with Ingrid. Uh, maybe I'll ask you, uh, there's a question from the audience. They want to know more clearly what field of mathematics Ms. Akani worked in and how it straddled different fields. How exactly did she blend the tools from different fields of her research? I think that's a really interesting question. Maybe you can shed some light. Well, she, she, she worked in, in, uh, in, in this geometry of understanding surfaces and, and, and uh, what happened on then and uh, but she also linked it with dynamical systems and uh, so actually it's very often that uh, very interesting breakthroughs happen when uh, tools from one field are used in a different field so at the interface between different disciplines and so people who are really good at understanding what's so special about the tools in one discipline and recognize problems where they can use them elsewhere can make breakthroughs like that. Mm -hmm. So let me ask uh, Diana, you know, in, when we try to talk about mathematics, you know, as, as uh, Ingrid was saying, and as Costa was saying, if we probe a little more deeply into the meanings of the words quickly, we, we get into a technical area where um, um, words require some study to understand the meaning of 
but you've been very effective in making rather abstract and difficult mathematics look very concrete and approachable. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the way you view Mariam's mathematical work and how you might explain it to young minds that are eager to know something about her mathematics? Yeah, absolutely. So I thought the movie did a really good job with this, with um, explaining that she worked on surfaces and in particular on straight lines on surfaces. So for example, if you walk in a straight line on a sphere, you come back to where you start. If you, or, or on a torus, the surface of a donut, sometimes you come back to where you start, but sometimes you might circle around and never come back to where you start. Um, so that's the sort of thing she worked on. Um, and I have studied a similar thing, but with billiards. So I've studied billiards on the regular Pentagon, which, which looks something like this. Um, and I've studied that problem very hard and given a lot of talks about it. And um, so how I would contrast the difference between the work that I do and the work that she does is that I'm studying one problem, very, just one problem. And so I really understand billiards on the regular Pentagon and I, I talk about it and I help people to see how beautiful it is and that sort of thing. Um, but Mariam would never have, um, been satisfied with a problem like billiards on the regular Pentagon. She wanted to understand all of them. Um, and Alex Wright talked about this in the film that she wanted to understand everything all at once. So this is something that students could, could take away from her work is that you might start by trying to understand one thing like one surface or one billiard table, um, but then you might challenge yourself to try to understand some much larger problem that it's just a small part of. Mm -hmm. very, very interesting. You know, in your answer, you used the word uh, beautiful. Uh, and I, I wonder how um, people react to that, uh, because not everyone understands the, the connection that mathematics is a beautiful uh, activity and aesthetic, there's an aesthetic experience as well. Uh, there's also an aspect uh, that is very mystical in a way of uh, the role of intuition and imagination. You, just, you saw in the movie, how uh, she would go and talk to her advisor, Curtis McMullen, about uh, how she thought things would be, but uh, uh, without having an idea of how to prove it at the time. And yet she had a very clear intuition. This is what, what I'm heading towards, what I'm trying to prove. I, I think, I wonder, uh, Ingrid, if you could talk to us a little bit about this, the role of uh, intuition and imagination, because the public may not be aware of how, how important a role those are in actually the doing of mathematics. Well, when you get really worked into a problem, you, it becomes a landscape. Uh, it becomes familiar with it. And you know, you, you have not a concrete visual thing that you could draw because it's, it, there's too much abstraction in it, but still you have visual analogies and, and, and so on. And so with the analogies that you've built, you can see that they have their holes and, and you can imagine where things go. And, uh, and so you intuit that there should be something there. I, so I'm an applied mathematician, but I mean, when I build the theory to, to, to build, to then apply later, it's just the same. It's just as abstract. And, and, and I have this, 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 in my imagination, I interact with these things. I knock them to one side and I see what happens to them. And, 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 and so you, you, you get a very, you use all the senses you have in order to try to get to the understanding of it. And they become your kind of mysterious friends because if they were really your friends, you would completely understand them, but you don't quite understand them. But you, you do intuit things about them. And you say, if this is correct and that and so on. And then sometimes it's not correct. And then you feel very frustrated because you didn't quite get it. But then you tinker more with it until you understand better why it didn't work. I mean, that resonated with me that, that, that she, would, she would say, now, why does that not work? It tells you something very interesting. You can put your finger on the difficulty and that is some teaching you something and you want to get that out. I don't know why that's an answer. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it is an answer. I think the point is that uh, uh, this is really a remarkable um, um, window into the way mathematics is done, uh, that there is a lot of human aspects to it. There's the oh, sense of the absolutely. beautiful, the intuitive, the imaginative. Um, uh, and so that's something I, I, I would like to hear more about because uh, the public doesn't always get a chance to um, um, to see that aspect. 
Uh, tell me also, any one of you could answer this part too, that you saw at one point where Eskin and uh, Alan Eskin and, and Alex Eskin and Mariam proved the theorem, but then there was a, a hole in it that they had to fix later on. Uh, here's another aspect of mathematical activity that may not be visible to people. Here, uh, if you think of it as a kind of very rational intellectual activity, how can you make a mistake? How can you, how can you possibly have a hole that you need to fix? Uh, how does that happen? Well, from from the story in the movie, it 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 it, it uh, recounted how they were relying on the the lemma that somebody had proved, and there had been a typo in that lemma. And so, uh, meaning it asserted something that wasn't proved. So if you if you build something with with something that when you push on it it breaks, well then your whole structure is no longer stable. Right. And so they had to build a scaffolding around that. I don't know whether that's to people who are closer to the field, uh, like like Casper uh, or Dina. Maybe you can say more about it. But uh... no, you did a great job. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> kind of what it is. I mean. The, the thing is, you know, the, people think art and imagination and so on, but these objects that you study, they're, they're, so you can use imagination somehow like to, to imagine how the things could be. And then, but then at the end of the day, you have to prove it. You have to show that this is true, right? right. So sometimes, so you have the picture in your mind uh, and it, it's so consistent that you, you, you're kind of sure that it's, that is there that is there. that's what you see like you see different pieces and enough of it that you kind of are still to to build a structure is there's there's extra step in there right and then so you could be missing the stuff like the, in in your head everything makes sense but as when you write the paper you have to write all the pieces together like the lego pieces and then, then there's a column missing and unfortunately in our field that's the that's the end of that <laughs> and 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 there are circ there are instances in mathematics where people were missing a piece and there was a real piece missing and actually studying that missing piece revealed a whole lot of new structures i mean right. non euclidean right. geometry was developed right. that right. way. or even in algebraic number theory the early attempts to prove from other last theorem yeah. were like that uh, so that's uh, that's really interesting. Uh, George, let me try to bring you into the conversation. I think you've done a really remarkable job in, in producing this movie, uh, especially the way you've captured how mathematics is actually done, which is what we've been talking about in the last few minutes. Uh, but, and I see from your filmography that you, you've made many wonderful features on, on uh, mathematics and mathematicians. And I wonder if I can probe you a little bit on your motivation. What, what fascinates you about mathematicians and their stories? Uh, do you see in their life or in their struggle or in their achievement something that goes beyond the discipline? Is there a human story there besides the math? Well, I, I certainly do. Um, and I think you, we just had a perfect example in uh, Ingrid's explanation that um, I, I observed in the, in the very first mathematicians how uh, they're able to uh, feel touch and use language uh, that brings abstract ideas uh, into some kind of physical relationship with with their uh, with their brains mm -hmm. and this is something that most people are unable to do and uh, to to try to expose a little of that to the general public of that experience uh, that mathematicians seem to share where where these abstract ideas are just very real and and touchable uh, tangible uh, you, you describe them with colors, with uh, mm -hmm. analogies to architecture, with um, uh, analogies to movement, and, and all kinds of things that to um, a, a person who, who is not familiar with thinking abstractly um, is, is very unusual. And I think it's, it's extremely, um, it has its own aesthetic mm -hmm. uh, and, and invites you, uh, invites curiosity. And so the general public who, who uh, seem to be suspicious of mathematics can see an opening to, to what's going on in, in, the, uh, in the mental processes and why uh, someone can become so passionate about an abstract idea. Uh, and this is what attracted me. And this is uh, uh, mathematicians are extremely generous to, to non-mathematicians about trying to explain themselves. Um, and so I, f I found it very easy to ask people questions because they're willing to talk to you about what they love and where they find beauty. Mm -hmm. So once again, we're seeing the, the tremendous human element uh, in the doing of mathematics, the search for beauty, the experience of joy, 
the role of intuition and imagination. You know, I on this question of abstraction and uh, what is concrete and what is abstract, I have a view that perhaps we call what we don't understand abstract, and as we begin to understand it, it becomes concrete. Uh, I remember. I remember a long time ago uh, trying to study uh, something in etal cohomology, uh, which we barely understood. And Michael Arton was the instructor, uh, and he said, "Draw a picture." And we said, "Draw a picture of what?" <laughs> this was this some abstract concept. And he came up to the board and drew a picture. And for him, that abstract thing was a totally concrete uh, entity. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's an interesting uh, point. Uh, there's some more questions here about Miriam's mathematics. I wonder if uh, maybe Kasra, you're maybe the right person to, to speak a little bit about this. Uh, what is the importance of knowing the number of closed simple geodesics on a surface? And, and does that have an application, if you know that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so the, the, each particular question you pick, um, we can get into why that question is, is important or how it came about. but. You know, like I think the better way to think about it is somehow like a larger picture. Like you, you have some objects which many different fields of mathematics get to. Like in, in this case, modular space of Riemann surfaces, like a space of all possible shapes a surface can have. And you want to understand this because you know it's a central object in mathematics is right in front of your face. If you want to understand other things, you have to like get past this point, right? It's the dark room with an elephant kind of question. If, if you have some object, you don't understand it, how do you understand it? Like you, you touch different aspects of it and you try to get information out of it like that. So uh, someone like coming up with questions is equally as hard sometimes as, as answering them because you want, they're like, what should I be curious about? I want, like, the goal is not to answer any specific question. The goal is to understand, yeah. right? And then the way we understand is by asking specific questions and answering them. And then, so the details of the, the object kind of reveal themselves to us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the, right. People can say the, maybe the solution is much more interesting than the, <laughs> than yeah. the, the yeah. question itself and so on, because it connects so many different pieces of mathematics and so on. To, to me, it, it, um, I could be curious. I mean, like the interesting part of this particular question is that if you have different shapes and you count the number of closed geodesics in them, it somehow doesn't depend on the shape. It's like no matter what shape you pick, asymptotic for really large uh, lengths, the number of curves of given length are the same. Like, this fact is just like unbelievably amazing. So yeah, to me, it's like it's part of reality that we live in. These objects exist, and I want to know what's what's going on in the in the real world of mathematics, right? And so th this phenomenon exists that this independence and the shape exists, and uh, so discovering it is a, is a true breakthrough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I like this point you're making that uh, it's not so much that you pick a problem and you want to work on the problem, but you're trying to understand conceptually how things hold together. Uh, right. And then exploring that, you discover there are some things we know, some things we don't know, and then you try to fill in the holes and that reveals uh, uh, new knowledge. That's, that's a very good point. Uh, maybe Diana, I'll ask you to jump in on this also. I mean, this must be a question you get uh, often asked often, perhaps that people ask, what's the use of something, you know, when, when you say this is a beautiful piece of mathematics, what's the use of it? How do you, how do you answer that, uh, that kind of comment? Yeah, absolutely. As mathematicians, we get this question at the end of basically every talk for a general audience. Um, and I would give two answers. Um, one is that sometimes a piece of mathematics has applications later that you never anticipated. For example, people studied number theory, the, ster the theory of prime numbers, for 300 years because it was beautiful and interesting. And then 30 or 40 years ago, suddenly all of that mathematics that people had developed came into use um, in terms of information security. So keeping your credit card safe in online transactions. And when people were studying these things in the 1700s, if they had given a talk and someone said, what are the applications? They would have said, there are no applications, but now there are many applications and we all use them every day uh, without realizing it. If you go to HTTPS website, um, it may be encrypted with prime numbers or some other thing that people were not thinking about applications when they developed. And then the answer that I like better is that uh, we don't study mathematics because because of the applications it might have. We study it because it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I have colleagues in the department of, of theater and dance who, who do choreography or who, who write music. 
And when they give a talk or a performance, nobody raises their hand at the end and says like, what are the applications of this? They say, wow, that was beautiful. And um, mathematics is a liberal art, just like music and rhetoric. Um, mathematics is three of the original seven liberal arts. And um, we should embrace it as such. We study it because it's beautiful and interesting and studying it um, makes us more human. That's really that's a really beautiful answer. After uh, mathematics, is, yes, go ahead, Ingrid. And I agree completely. It doesn't hurt that it helps with applications. <laughs> <laughs> and this is from an applied mathematician. <laughs> but, but I agree with you. I mean, and I study it for the beauty. I mean, uh, but but I think once you've really understood things, things automatically have applications because that's how we are. When mm -hmm. we we know things, we see connections elsewhere. And we, we use everything. I mean, that's what creativity is about. Uh, you, you, you always are doing creative things. You're always using things for other things than they were originally designed for. You know it, and now you can use it. I like to also give the examples of just uh, the number line. I mean, so every, every kid learns it. Everybody knows that if you get decimal numbers, a decimal expansion of a number, it gives you more and more precision about where to put it on the number line. That's something that's become part of what you absorb in, in primary school, uh, in elementary school. And that's something that the, the Greek mathematicians would have found miraculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's become part of our culture. Everybody knows it. But that was something they were grappling with. So it's, it's, it's not just cryptography, it's even right. things that every kid now knows. Right. And that's right. part of, of us and that right. had to be acquired. Right. And imagine, you know, the, some of the mathematics that we take for granted almost like calculus at the time it was invented was uh, not believed. I mean, Newton had yeah. to justify what he was doing. Well, and, uh, but we have many students who still don't believe. <laughs> <laughs> but the number line, everybody believes the number line. <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, George, uh, here's a question for you. Uh, in your uh, movie, you, you documented very beautifully, not only Mariam's uh, mathematics and the human aspect of the mathematics, but, but just uh, the, uh, Mariam as an individual, as a person, uh, one, one of our audience members would like to know, what's the most surprising or interesting thing you learned about Mariam while making the movie? You're muted, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, the, I, I, um, I talked about it in the introduction that um, as a journalist, uh, I was looking for um, contrast and uh, contrast and uh, uh, stories about people uh, comes in uh, it, in terms of flaws and uh, I couldn't find I as, as far as I would dig I couldn't find anything that uh, any, any that was negative and that uh, really, uh, I, I interviewed over 50 people and I kept hammering away. It's like, come, give me something where, you know, she, there was a little bit of a dip I can explore. And uh, no, it just didn't happen. And I felt uh, that I was a failure as a journalist. Um, and, you know, it, it, it felt a little strange to, to, uh, to make a film about someone who might actually be a saint. <laughs> I think that's unusual. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> So mathematics has that effect, you know, it makes people think. <laughs> uh, so here's another question for, uh, sorry, the, the Ingrid, do you want to jump in on that, that question? Were you going to, okay. So here's a question for uh, uh, people about uh, um, education. Mariam and her friend and colleague Roya had such strong support from teachers as a child and in high school. We saw that in the movie. What can the panelists advise to educators today to spark student curiosity in mathematics? and develop mathematical thinking. What can we do as educators, whether we're in schools or in colleges or in universities? What, uh, what can we do? That's something probably we do every day. <laughs> but anyone, anyone of you can jump in on that. Well, I, I think one thing is to have a teacher who already experienced him or herself the beauty of mathematics. That is very powerful because it's a very human thing and we respond to body language to enthusiasm to and so on you communicate that 
but I also think it was fantastic for uh, uh, for them both, for Mariam and Rocha, to to have to have had each other, mm -hmm. because you learn so much from your peers, and you you challenge each other, and uh, and you learn also different ways of thinking from others, and uh, and it's just that's fun, and that interacting with somebody else is fun, and. Mariam, by all accounts, I, I knew her as a colleague at Princeton, but I never worked with her. But by all accounts, she really liked working with others. And, uh, and as do many mathematicians. It used to be that uh, mathematicians published papers by themselves much more than they do now. They, now it's much more accepted and realized that there's so much fun in working together with people. Mm -hmm. and you have that whole human level of interacting with each other. That's, and if you have a, a great collaborator, that is something that you build on for your, your whole career and your life. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, so all these things are important to, to convey to kids, but the enthusiasm for mathematics is important. And so we should also celebrate all good teachers mm -hmm. because uh, unfortunately, right now we need more teachers in schools than there are good and enthusiastic mathematicians willing to go teach in the school. So some teachers are not originally trained in mathematics and have a little bit of, of, of uh, fear of mathematics as well. And that conveys, that gets conveyed as well by a teacher. Yeah. So, uh, but so every single good teacher we should celebrate and we should, uh, it, it's a fantastic thing. Diana, would you like to jump in on that? Yeah, another thing that I think is really important is providing interesting problems for students to work on. So in the film, there was an example of a time when Mariam and Roya gave six different solutions to a given problem. And that's extraordinary for them to have done, but it's also a, a real credit to the problem writer that they wrote such a rich problem that there was so much for the students to explore. So, um, giving students a problem that they can really sink into and, and explore um, is really important. Um, and so, yeah. Mm -hmm. George, you wanted to say something? Yeah. I, yes, um, I, I would uh, like to add only that I, the most exciting thing I ever learned about mathematics was that there were unsolved problems. Mm -hmm. And I think too many teachers uh, hold that back. And the earlier that students learn that the world of unsolved problems is larger than the world of solved problems, the more exciting the, the field could be for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it, in many cases, it's not until graduate school that they realize that the answer is not at the back of the book, <laughs> that uh, there are still things that aren't known. Uh, Kastra, did you want to say something about uh, how uh, teachers could uh, um, spark curiosity in mathematics and develop mathematical thinking in people? No, I, I agree with Ingrid, I think. I mean, the, often the problem comes from the fact that the teacher who is teaching doesn't enjoy the material at all. Like uh, when we are teaching the teachers, I guess we should be kind of more careful at that point it's because that's what the level we, we teach. I mean, if you transfer the joy, they can transfer it a little further to the to the students. If if you know if they see it as a dry thing themselves, then that's what the students will get out of it, mm -hmm. um, right? So it is up to us to kind of like not just go to and present stuff, like but to, to just <laughs> yeah, just right. give part of yourself to the to the students. Also. So I like your idea of the hyperbolic lunches. I mean that <laughs> that uh, brings a social and a mathematical component together. Uh, so you you enjoy each other's company while doing mathematics, and uh, that that could. That's right. Learning. A bunch of people who talk to me individually, but they don't talk to each other. They don't know the other person exists. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very human thing. They want to know different personalities who are doing the difficulties they have and the different ways they react to to the same thing, even though their their fields are not exactly the same. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, and we want to be casual, so we made it be like this lunch. So you bring your food, and it's kind of messy and. By you know design, there's lots of movements and so on. So nobody takes the speaker so seriously; they can be interrupted yeah, quite yeah. frequently. And then they, you can go over time if you want to, and there's no problem. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's been a great experience. I think no, that's, 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 that's really good. Community. So now here's some questions about uh, beginning graduate students. Uh, you know, that's the big jump when you go from undergraduate to graduate. 
uh, it's not structured courses anymore. You're, you're thrown right into the world of seminars. You're thrown into the world of the unknown and you're expected, you know, down a few, door, a few years down, you're supposed to prove something that nobody else has proved and be able to get your paper accepted in a peer reviewed journal. But that could be a quite a daunting thing. So what, what would you advise for a beginning graduate student in mathematics? Uh, specifically, let's say they wanted to, they were inspired by uh, Miriam's work and wanted to get into that field. What would they do? Or more generally, how do you navigate that, uh, those early waters, which are, could be, look scary a little bit in terms of finding your uh, advisor and finding a problem and finding an area? Any, any general words of advice on those? Yeah, I mean, so since I guess I'm still talking, so I'll keep going. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think the main point is to, to tell them that it, there are times that you don't understand things. There are times that you are scared. There are times Mariam didn't understand things. There were times she was scared. Like there were times she were wrong and so on. I mean, so maybe there, there were no flaws in her personality, <laughs> but so, so certainly like, you know, not everything she tried to do, she could do. Not every thought she had was correct. It's, it's not like that. I mean, a large portion of our time, we are kind of scared. We don't understand. We go to seminars. Like you should tell them that, you know, it's, it's not like everybody, like, you know, no. the, the fear you feel is kind of normal. And then <laughs> you just, you know, you go with it. And then you, you, you know, it's like learning a language. You go to a new country, you have no idea what's going on. It's not because what they're saying is complicated. It's just in a language you don't, you don't know. You're not familiar okay. with. And after okay. you learn the language, then that the thoughts come naturally to you also. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very good. Did anyone else want to add something to that? Or, yeah, Diana? Yeah, um, one of the biggest things I learned in graduate school was that my, my perspective changed on, on what it was about. Like when I came in at the beginning, I thought that my job was to learn some mathematics and prove some theorem and write a paper. Uh, and that was it. But I learned that really what I was doing was entering a field and entering a mathematical community. So I sort of, at the beginning, I thought about it as sort of a solving a puzzle and that people would somehow uh, publish. Um, but then as I started going to conferences and meeting people like Kazra and, and the wonderful field that Mariam and Kazra and I are in of, of flat surfaces and billiards, I learned that what I was really doing was entering into this community of people who like to think about the kind of things that I like to think about. Mm -hmm. So that really, it really, dawned on me um, in my first year as a postdoc when I, when I met Kazra and I found out that this guy that I had never met who lived in Canada had read my thesis, <laughs> right? And um, I, why was he reading my thesis? Because he was in a community of people who care about this thing. Mm -hmm. And so changing the worldview of students, it, it would make it so much less scary to mm -hmm. go from, oh, I have to solve this puzzle to I'm entering into this community of people yeah like the things that I like. That's really nice. That's, uh, that's a good point. Of, uh, it's a collaborative network, a yeah. group of people that are, and maybe that's a good segue to the next question for Ingrid. Uh, one, one audience member asks, uh, now that we find more collaborative work going on in mathematics, will that help increase the number of women choosing to study mathematics? Do you think that Well, I dearly hope so. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's not, I mean, people ask, me often, I mean, what should happen to get more women? And I, I have, if I had the answer, I would have implemented it 40 years ago and we would have tons of women now. So I don't have the answer. I, I do believe it's mostly a cultural thing because the number of women, if you look at the map of Europe, the number of women in mathematics and academia varies enormously from one country to the next. Mm -hmm. And their genetics don't vary that much. So, uh, um, but, so I think it's a self-perpetuating thing. But it's also uh, the, the different perception, what Diane was saying is, is, is very true. And actually, I tell my students at the beginning, I, I don't give my graduate students a problem. I, I try to find what they're interested in and we meet often, but I tell them that what they do in the beginning, as part, besides of taking courses, is build a kind of intellectual mathematical landscape mm -hmm. of the, the region in which they will, they're interested and they will find what exists and so on. And as you build that landscape, you also see what are the directions in which people are curious and where there's still gaps, trails to, 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 uh, to tidy up so that more can be done. 
and then a problem typically suggests themselves and i can see that they are finding this very very weird at the beginning and i tell them don't worry i'll be here i mean i'll i'll be there on 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 the road and 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 it it works out i mean it's a mystery to me but it does work out they they find and and so on and they they explore and they build they find their community and 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 they find but it's it's really an adventure you do with others and you look mm -hmm. at what others have done and what is still open and, and and i also tell them when they give a talk that they have to tell a story i mean if it was just a difficult problem and you show the technicalities of how you solved it i mean how boring can that be can you imagine somebody <laughs> telling you the story of how they found this particular puzzle piece in that big jigsaw puzzle i mean but that's not what it's about. It's you, you tell the story, you describe the landscape, you describe this, this little nook that, that was mysterious and you found the right torchlight to illuminate it. And, and, and now there's more to be done. And, uh, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, it always amazes me that people don't realize how human mathematics is. It's a oh, okay. human enterprise. So that's, this sounds like to me a very good theme that uh, we've, we've uh, managed to repeat again and again and again. It is a very human activity. It's a very creative activity. Uh, it has all sorts of, uh, it requires intuition. It requires imagination. There's beauty in it. Uh, all of these attributes are things I hope that the, uh, the audience uh, get, comes with. Kastra, were you trying to say something? No, okay, good. So I, we're almost out of time. I want to give the, the last question to George. Uh, George, I mean, your beautiful movie is uh, sort of what, what uh, catalyzed uh, this evening's program and uh, conveyed the message of uh, what uh, um, Mariam was and her work more eloquently than, than us standing up at the board and trying to explain our mathematics, I think. Uh, I, what um, I want to know from you, what uh, whether uh, uh, you have any further plans for making movies about mathematicians and uh, what you might uh, attempt to do next, because if you, uh, we, we hope you do have such plans and we'll be eagerly awaiting for your next movie. Uh, well, uh, thank you uh, for, for the kind words. I, I do have plans. Uh, um, everything, of course, is on hold in terms of shooting. I have uh, shoots planned in the, uh, 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 in Washington, D.C. and uh, Buffalo, New York. Uh, one is a project involving uh, history of African-American mathematicians. Oh. And uh, other is a project for American women in mathematics. Um, and those are short-term plans, but uh, everything at the moment is on hold for mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. And um, we'll see where what happens next. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's interesting that uh, in, even in spite of the pandemic, we're able to get together like this and enjoy this conversation and, and share it, not only with, between this amongst us, but with a couple of hundred people who are, who are listening in and even contributing questions. So that's the joy of technology. So unfortunately, we're out of time. And uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing their insights. Uh, it's been a really great uh, conversation. An inspiring evening, I think, inspiring in terms of the mathematics, in terms of the human story of discovery, facing and overcoming difficulties, uh, in terms of ideas that transcend an individual and embrace a community, uh, ideas that help shape a subject, uh, and in terms of wonderful conversation with bright people such as our panelists, uh, and in terms of the enthusiastic participation of our audience. Uh, so I thank all of you very much uh, for your participation. If you, uh, now I'm addressing the audience, if you'd like to see more of this kind of event, uh, send us an email or, or reach us on social networks and tell us. Uh, we will be delighted to organize more because we get a lot of pleasure in sharing with you uh, ideas from the world of mathematics, what mathematics is, how it is done, uh, and what it means for the uh, human endeavor. Uh, it remains to thank everyone involved. Whenever you see an event going off well uh, and smoothly, it means a lot of people work very hard behind the scenes to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, first, of course, our panelists for your insightful comments. Special thanks to George for allowing us to screen the mm -hmm. film. Yes. A, big, uh, a big thank you to the wonderful staff of the Fields Institute who put this program together with such care. Esther, Brittany, Miriam, Kate, Bryn, and Brian, and I hope I haven't uh, forgotten anybody, but if I have, please apologies, but you've done a fantastic job. And on behalf of the panelists and the audience, let's say a big thank you to all of the staff at the Field Institute. Yes.
So good night, everyone. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and we will meet again uh, to talk mathematics and uh, share some interesting stories. Thank you. Good night. Keep well. Thank you. Good night.